All right, I guess we'll get started. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to the fifth um, lecture in the Brodsky, Brodsky series for library conservation. And I'd like to say a big thank you to Joan and Bill, who unfortunately are not able to make it this year, but we hope to see them again next year. Um, this year's speaker is Chayla Metzger, who's a librarian, bookbinder, and book conservator, and has taught many of today's and future conservators at the Kilgarland Center for the Preservation of the Cultural Record at the University of Texas at Austin and as such is highly qualified to speak on tonight's topic, Rare Skills for Rare Books. Um, she's a graduate of the North Bennett Street School in Boston, the most comprehensive program for learning bookbinding in North America, and received her MLS from Simmons, I believe, in Boston. Um, after completing an internship in rare book conservation at the Library of Congress in 1994, she worked as a project conservator for over five years at the Huntington Library Rare Book Collections in San Marino, California. She's also worked on some Getty-sponsored conservation education programs for visiting South American conservators, and in 2000 conducted a three-month Fulbright in lectureship in Argentina. Her particular interest is in Latin American print culture, the history of books and reading, and the material culture of record-keeping structures used in archives and accounting. It is these structures that will be the focus of her hands-on workshop this weekend. So I'd like you to all welcome Chayla Metzger, and I hope you enjoy the lecture. Oh, thank you, Peter. Um, that was that was very sweet. It's great to be here. Uh, I want to thank um, Peter for inviting me and the Brodsky folks for making this possible. And you, the rare people who would give up your um, Friday afternoon for a book on, for a lecture on uh, on rare book conservation. Um, so thank you very very much. Any of you who want to move forward, you'll be able to see the images better. I mean, you know. Feel free. Come on up. <coughs> no? Well, you want to sneak out the back? All right. Um, now, um, just to get a quick sort of idea here, how many of you are involved in book work in some way? How many of you are librarians? Are, okay, great. Wonderful. This is the audience I want to be uh, speaking to. Now, this is a slightly different question. Um, how many of you have found in your life work that you love? Okay, fair number, that's great. And this is a very different question. How many of you think that graduate school is the absolutely best way to pursue your passions in life? Right, nobody. <laughs> All right, I just, I just want to make that clear. Um, do you believe in the power and importance of education broadly? Yes? Yes, we believe in education. Um, so that disconnect between our belief in education and our sensibilities about what a graduate program is and it's not necessarily about doing what you love. Um, that's where I live. That's the disconnect that I live in. And um, not that I'm going to be dwelling on it, but I just sort of wanted you to viscerally see that. Um, now, when I talk about library conservation, um, clearly I'm going to be talking about the influence of art conservation on library um, conservation work and on book conservation. And I'm going to kind of use library conservation and book conservation not exactly interchangeably, because I think we'll see pretty clearly where they're similar and where we're different, but um, I may not always make a perfect distinction when I talk. And the other thing I'm going to say is that my images do not always exactly mirror what I'm going to be talking about, but I hope that they illustrate some of the thought processes behind book conservation. And, you know, a lot of, some of the images are from the web and they don't have any kind of, um, uh, you know, footnote at the bottom there. Some of the images will say if, if they're from student work and the rest of them are, are mine from work that I've done. Um, the first con um, art conservation program, um, NYU, claims to be the first in 1960. I think that it's a graduate program and maybe they define graduate differently in Europe. It's hard for me to believe that NYU was the very first graduate program in the whole wide world, which is what the literature says, um, in 1960, but maybe it was. Um, in any case, 1960, which shows you that issues of graduate education and conservation are kind of young. And to put it bluntly, conservation has no hood color. Those of you in academia may think, okay, I graduated with lemon yellow, um, because I was a librarian or whatever. It, conservation doesn't actually have that. You get a master's in something, and then you get an advanced certificate uh, in conservation along with that. And that's true for all of the 
North American conservation programs. Um, but I don't really think you came here today to talk about, or to hear me talk about, well, the formations of professions and graduate record exams and syllabi and assignments and tests and certifications and all of that. Um, I think you might have come because you wanted to hear about passion, about connecting with your work um, in a passionate kind of way. And um, I hope I can, can incorporate some of those concerns because I think we're all concerned that we love our work at a certain level. Um, and I am passionate about books, um, have been since I was a wee thing. And I'm very interested, really, in where form meets function, and that's true in many crafts. I've just tended to focus on um, bookmaking here. And I'm also passionate about collections of books. Um, I'm a librarian, and I really believe in the power that a collection represents. And I'm really very, very passionate about cul cultural heritage in general, and the folks I work with tend to be passionate about cultural heritage in a, in a broad sense, about preserving what we've got and carrying it into the future for use. Um, I really believe in humility in the face of old books. Um, they've been around a while, they've seen lives that we can't imagine, and there they all are. Um, and even more, I think it's very important um, in conservation to be, um, have humility in the face of decay, that we're all decaying, to put it bluntly, and so the stuff that we're working on for the most part, maybe the ideal is to go into digital preservation. <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, um, can we all admit that it wasn't the most practical choice on anyone's part to say, I'm passionate about books and I'm going to make it my life. Um, accounting would have been more practical, a different kind of book uh, <laughs> reality. And I think when you enter, when you decide to yourself, well, I'm going to make my passion a, bar a bigger part of my life, um, it's a great opportunity, but you're entering a different economy. You're going to enter the kind of economy where people say, oh, you know, that wasn't very smart of you. You know, you don't have that many jobs in that field. And you're like, yeah, 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 OK. Um, so this is me before formal education. It says down there, I want to be a book binder. It does not say, gee, I want to take a GREs and get a good grade point average. And um, no. But I was a librarian before I went into book work. And I had always wanted to be a librarian. My father took me around in his bookmobile when I was young, because he was a librarian. And well, you know, I was a nerd. And my first teacher had worked with Bill Anthony. Um, and I'm taking all these images from a, a little booklet I've got up here on sort of genealogies of book conservation training. Bill Anthony was an apprentice. He died in 1988, 89? Yeah, 89. Um, and he was an apprentice in Ireland and came to Chicago and took formal apprentices, some of which you see listed here. And the one that was hidden is Mark Esser, um, who then started the North Bennett Street School in the 80s. The North Bennett Street School was a school that I went to to learn um, book binding after I went to library school. And it was trying to sort of compress down a formal apprenticeship as it's been interpreted through the years, five to seven years sort of thing, maybe shorter, um, into a very you know, tight two-year period, six hours a week, five days, six hours a day, five days a week, 10 months a year for two years. Um, but it was a bench, class, bench kind of school, um, and it took its place along jewelry making, uh, locksmithing, cabinetry, fine carpentry, and all kinds of other things at, at a craft school in Boston. Now, after I kind of fell in love with uh, conservation decision making at that point. I just thought, this is so interesting. I can't stop thinking about it. So I did a, um, an internship. I was accepted for an internship at Library of Congress, which was great. Um, and in this very long family tree, which I'm not going to go through, but you know, at the top, it's the 1870s. And then at the bottom, it's 1990s. And um, there's Tom Albro down at the very bottom there. Um, and if there was a takeaway point for Mark Esser and North Bennett, it was his sort of phrase that he started us out with, that every book is different. Um, that may sound like, no, they don't. They come out in editions. But by the time you're getting a hold of them, generally, every book is different. Um, Tom Albro, I couldn't come away with a phrase from working with Tom, perhaps, but he just approached every phase of his work with such grace, I've always thought. Um, now, I work in a program that has German roots. So you saw Irish, you saw English, here's German. Um, and the uh, preservation conservation studies as it started at 
Columbia um, in Manhattan and later moved to Texas was started by Paul Banks, who was part of this sort of complicated family tree. And he studied with some German binders, in particular Carolyn Horton, um, who got her training in Vienna. And um, at this point in 1991, um, Paul was still with us. He died in 2000, and I never met him. But I came across a wonderful article in 1981 with all these images of folks who had been working with Paul Banks at the Newberry Library in Chicago. And um, it happens that there's Maria Fredericks, who I also worked under at the Huntington and just learned so much from. She had such a sort of practical and happy approach to her work, I thought. And there's Gary. Uh, you had a lecture from him a few years ago, sewing up a book at the Newberry, 1981. And I don't think you can think about books in America without kind of running into Gary. Um, and there's Pamela Spitzmuller measuring sewing holes at the Newberry, 1981. And I think that all of us who work with historic structures are very grateful to Pamela um, for her sensitivity and creativity in that regard. And there's Paul, um, who I never met. But he built a library conservation education structure modeled after art conservation. But people get a master's in library information science, and then they get the, um, the certificate in conservation of library and archives materials. Paul Banks, interestingly enough, had a high school diploma. And that was it. Now, all of this, um, you know, we're thinking about books, we're thinking about book binding, we're thinking about apprenticeships and different, you know, training patterns. I think we're looking at craft and craft traditions. <coughs> and, you know, in America, I think a lot of our ideas about craft are very influenced by the arts and crafts <coughs> movement, a kind of a warm, fuzzy romance about the idea of craft um, in a sense that, oh, you're sitting somewhere beautiful and you're working with beautiful tools and you're involved in something unique. And, um, it's kind of hard to shake that, but you know, you saw that lady with a the microscope there, the art conservation program. You're putting yourself at a sort of a distance in a way. I mean, you're looking closely with a microscope, but you're not really entering into the life of the object as if your craft skills and the craft skills that made that object could intersect particularly, or even should intersect. And that's a question, should they intersect? And in conservation, that's a question you have to ask. But I think that other materials that receive use, we also have these craft associations. Historic building work, we think of craft. Musical instrument, historic musical instrument um, work, we might think of craft skills. And historic furniture, three that come to mind, items that have had lived a life of use and in order to be interpreted properly might need to be usable again, maybe not. But there's your craft book binder. Um, working away, underpaid, and at, you know, always with a deadline. Let's keep that in mind. Um, but the idea then of craft in this situation might be preserving a craft that allows you to enter intimately into the life of an object. Um, whether you should do that or not is, a, is another question. But I think that's why we, we think about craft and why we kind of want to think about craft with some of these issues. Now, to kind of get us grounded in a conservation or you know, some of the steps involved in book conservation, I've got a treatment I'm going to run through here on a um, volume that I worked on at the Huntington. It's a 1624, um, kind of a large volume. Um, it's Latin and Greek. It belonged in a humanist library. It had humanist notations. The spine is actually not done at the same time as the rest of the book, it seemed. It's a different reality somehow, but very cleverly done. However, it was no longer attached. But it had a lot of gold on it. It's not really attached anymore. And the curator says, well, there's a researcher that's been using this. And um, the spine fell off. And he's coming back next summer. And can you stick it back on? OK, I can stick the spine back on. And I tried sort of a simple fix first. And then I thought, well, OK, I'll put it in a box. But it kept haunting me because I knew there were problems here. It was not a simple fix. And it's basically got what I'd call broken rafters that you can't put a roof on. You don't put a roof on something eaten up by termites. And Basically, when you look at this, you're seeing these, those, those, um, it's been sewn on leather that's very rigid and very brittle. It's already broken in half where you see it there. And then, you know, every time it really opens again, it's going to break again um, because those, that leather just can't handle, it's not flexible anymore. So I went to the curator and I said, look, I'm not happy with a the, with the simpler fix. I would like to do something um, 
more involved, more invasive. I have two interns. <laughs> you don't always have two interns to do this kind of thing with. And I knew it would be time consuming. Um, so I got permission to move forward with it, assuming we're going to keep all the original parts, the original spine, the original boards, um, and all of that. So um, there we are disbinding it. There's those rigid supports hanging out. And oh, I just don't like seeing that. Um, I, disbinding books gives me the heebie-jeebies. And um, a big pile of paper like that, to me, just looks so vulnerable. Um, and will I ever be able to get it back in a situation where I can reuse that original spine in the same dimensions? You know, is the book going to grow? It's already like three or four inches bigger, just sitting there all fluffy. Uh, so yeah. Um, Immediately, I thought, must re sew. <laughs> so um, we got it back. We you know, got some new, it's a different kind of sewing altogether. I did not follow the original sewing pattern. I did not reuse leather supports. Um, I would not do that. There was a problem to begin with. I wouldn't repeat it. Um, so I used a different sewing pattern, original sewing holes. The sewing supports are the same dimension, though, as those leather supports had been. And we were really intent on not getting too much um, dimensional change in the spine. So we used the same sewing pattern, even though it left some of the sections kind of woo, floppy at the ends. Um, there it is, new sewing. Um, that's, to my mind, in many ways, that's a book. Everything else that I put on it later, mm, it's got its sequence. It's back how the maker made it. And it's secure. But it doesn't have all its original parts, obviously. Now I'm going to start doing some stuff that isn't necessarily associated with craft book binding. This has got an overall lining of wheat starch paste and um, a long fiber Japanese paper that I'm hoping will serve as a reversibility layer, reversibility being a conservation um, kind of concern there. Now the cords are linen. I could have just as well used polyester. You know, there isn't a situation, I mean, we just, there's some things we do in book conservation that are just so tied to um, kind of handbook binding tradition that, you know, we always, oh, of course, linen cords. Mm -hmm. You know, there's probably other options, but they were there, and there, I'm not worried about them, but it's just kind of interesting. Um, and this next layer is made out of linen as well. It's a linen cloth, and it's got little bits overhanging because I had to cut off the boards. I'm going to put the boards back on. I need that cloth to help reattach my boards. But again, you know, could I have used polyester? Could I have used Tyvek? Could I've used all kinds of other things, probably, um, but there's my, my linen um, putting down between the supports there. And now I'm going to put the end bands. You know, I had end bands. I always put end bands back on, um, or not always, but I usually do if it happened because they're a sign of the status of the book. And um, also, I'm going to reuse the original boards, and end bands took up some space at the head and tail that um, I, I need to fill again. But I'm not going to do the same kind of in-band, not at all. Um, it had, you know, traces of an in-band that had just a few tie-downs, one every couple inches. And, um, you know, I did a kind of a foundational in-band here that serves to remedy some of the problems with the sewing. And it's also going to really mechanically attach my linen lining there. And then the overlay is done with the same colors that we found hidden inside the text block. Um, and the, we don't know if they use this pattern. It's a pretty typical pattern. But so that's that is that doesn't even enter the text block. And no, I didn't use silk because I don't want to put silk inside the text block. It degrades. It doesn't have a you know, long lifespan. Um, so I didn't do that. Now here's um, yet another lining, and I use leather here. And it's it's a fairly thick piece of leather that's going to serve as a lining. And you know I could certainly question that decision. Um, but it, you know, I had faith in, the, in who had manufactured the leather, and I really wanted, that's a big fat book, and I really wanted to support it in action, and I'm trying to not use linings that take a big preferential crease. Um, and I keep the same profile from the up and down, so the contours of the spine. So, um, and that's how it opens after one lining, and I sort of like to stop at each lining and say, well, how's it doing? I can't put the original spine back on that. It will crack in half the first, the first time the book opens if I actually glue the spine directly to that, um, so I'm not going to do that. Um, I have a plan for that spine. My plan for that spine is that when a book opens, the book will open flat. Because I'm sort of thinking in a conservation engineering way. Okay, the original spine can go flat. It can't curve up, but it can go flat. It can at least go from slightly cupped to flat. So, now here's invasive treatment. I mean, that's what, that's, that's not pretty. 
Um, that's invasive. <laughs> and where do you hide new material? Um, you're always thinking about that. If you're going to put new material in, where does it go? Um, and is it ever okay to remove original material? In this situation, I did remove little notches of the original material. Um, no, it wasn't required. It was part of my plan for reattaching the boards firmly. So it seemed like a structurally good idea, but you know, it's removing original material. So, and that's a visual infill. Basically, it's new leather that's going to match the original leather as best as possible and recreate the caps. I'm not really thinking of this leather as structural. It's really a visual infill. Um, and there it is going down under the original leather. And this part's just such a traditional bookbinding thing, you know. I, if somebody came at it from a different discipline, you know, um, I don't know, paintings conservation or objects conservation, they might, they might reinvent the same thing or they might come up with something really interestingly different. It's just to get it to adhere on either side of the bands. Um, sometimes people do this to get those little rope markings on top of the leather, but in this situation that wasn't the case. I really was just trying to get the leather to stick down in some places it's hard to make it stick. And I'm removing some of my new leather so I can kind of tuck the original leather down into it. And there's you see, new and old together. Um, when I look at it, I feel like it's really clear. I can see the new and I can see the old, and I, I wouldn't really want to hide it any more than that. Um, that would kind of tug at my concerns about um, authenticity of the original object in conservation ethics. But there's that troublesome spine just waiting for me um, to finally put back on there. In the end, um, I ended up feeling like I couldn't reuse the leather and the original spine that went over those raised bands. It was just too fractured. So I carved um, the poor thing up. And there it is. You know, the gold is original and the new leather is sort of in between going over the bands. Um, and the conservation engineering part, not the aesthetics part, worked out satisfactorily from my point of view. The uh, book can be read. You see the text starting there. The spine flattens out and in a way that will be safe enough for the spine, and the old spine, the original spine, and that's that. Um, so you have to kind of sort out, well, which part of this is, um, is book binding? Which part of it is book conservation? Um, which part of it is, is, you know, moving from one kind of discipline or way of thinking to another? Or maybe it's not moving enough or it's moved too much. Lots of stuff to sort of sort through there. And when I, when I think of book conservation, I'm sort of haunted by this quote. I have been haunted by this quote for years, which is why I put it in the abstract. You know, there are not too many people ever talk about book conservation education, really. Um, and here's Christopher Clarkson in 1978, and this is his um, concluding sentence. The European bookbinding tradition does not form a good foundation to build or even craft book conservation education. Well, ouch. Um, I mean, because a lot of us who come from a book kind binding sort of background and move into conservation go, oh, man, you know, okay, Christopher Clarkson, I mean, he's really sensitive to book issues, so what do I think about this? Um, you know, and my answer is sort of like, oh, really? Okay, um, maybe. And you know, I think it's important to look, think Christopher Clarkson has been so important in our field, and I have to admit, I don't, you know, I, I, don't, I can't read German or, or French or Italian or others who may be saying incredibly brilliant things about book conservation education, and I'm sure that they are. So I'm sort of, you know, Clarkson and I, you know, we got to have this dialogue, not that I've ever met him, you know, but um, I don't get to have a dialogue at that same level, or I'm not reading um, folks from other traditions as much. But his article and his concerns are very much pre-1500. He was horrified by seeing these very early structures pushed into these nasty 19th century bindings, harming the text, destroying the historic voice of early books, and that's a binding that had been put on a 1504 um, book. And, with so much animal glue and saw cuts on the spine that there was, you know, I had a huge pile of paper with that book below there, City of God, 1504, that, I mean, there were no spine folds left. It was just a pile of horribly degraded paper and stuck in a 19th century sort of a fake Cambridge panel binding. It was sad. I mean, it had been re-back several times. But, no, that's pretty typical. So I asked some colleagues, one of who's here tonight, um, what they thought of that quote. What do you think about book conservation, um, book binding, um, and I, I wanted to ask people from different traditions. 
Um, Bill Mentor had a friend who's trained under Bill Anthony, like my teacher, um, Mark Esser. And uh, then he's like, what, philosophy, medicine? Is that the right background? And then he, he kind of makes a statement here that, yeah, you know, a European trained bookbinder would have trouble, maybe he would have trouble, with book conservation because he or she has to follow these strict traditions. Um, and Americans are not forced by any tradition to bind, you know, right, you know, to bind a particular way. So maybe as Americans, we don't face this as much as Christopher Clarkson um, <coughs> faced it. Maybe not. You know, I'm just, these are kind of responses here. I asked James Reed Cunningham, who went to the North Bennett Street School as I did, and who's now head of conservation at the Boston Athenaeum. And he suggested perhaps taxidermy, dentistry, or fly fishing as a background for book conservation, but he's kind of joking. Um, Taxidermy's got possibilities. Um, I don't know what other kind of training would, um, would ground us in bookmaking. Um, and really, he's quite right here in America, at least. Most of our conservation works to be done on these materials that probably are following craft traditions that Clarkson would not have approved of. He kind of loses interest after 1500. Um, the problem hasn't been that handbook binding practices are antithetical to conservation principles, but there's a tendency with structured training, especially structured training that lasts for years, to embrace the idea that their way of doing something is correct. Um, and, you know, it's not always true, but maybe that's a problem. Of course, we're all saying, gee, we need more conservation training. Schools should last longer and longer and longer. Yeah. So, um, when he says when he graduated, he felt he learned a lot, and I remember that feeling, and then you realize how little you know, and that the topic is really so big, and you really gotta be sort of humbled by what you see in front of you when you have care for a collection. Um, Donya Khan, who went to the school that I teach in, and she was never my student, um, and who used to work here, is now at the NADCC, so she went to a library conservation training program, says, well, you know, the easiest form of binding to teach um, is this traditional European technique, and we don't have time in these formal graduate programs to go into all the different structures that we should go into. And she also notes that coming from a traditional handbook binding track, she didn't think it was the best training for historic book structures, if that's all the training you get. <coughs> and she notes that we don't, we don't respect our collections as much as we should, our historic collections, and we don't respect those who care for them as much as we should in terms of our you know, conservation professionals, and that we need more opportunities to train I'm all for that. And here's from Jeff um, Peachy, who has a book conservation blog and has years of experience in different institutions and um, has, teaches and makes fantastic knives and all kinds of things. And he really noted that in 1978, when Clarkson was writing this, uh, professionalism in, had come to book conservation. Paul Banks was elected president of AIC, the first and I think last um, book conservator to be in that position. And so maybe we needed to just, you know, new profession, down with the old um, training, back, down with all of that, down with um, the dirty little word craft. Um, and the distancing may be the core message in Clarkson's um, statement. And I like this, in another 30 years, perhaps um, we'll be mature enough to re-examine our relationship to craft. I would like to think so. Um, and here's from Priscilla Anderson, who has an um, art conservation degree from Winterthur, and um, also a library degree, I think, from Catholic um, University, and is now conservator of the Harvard Business Library. Um, there is no one firm foundation for library conservation, a web of intersecting tight ropes, and you see all the various things that you might need to be able to pull upon, um, including library science, historic research, conservation science, treatment, preservation, um, you know, preventive thought, as well as, you know, craft book binding. And where you've got three of those, you can relax a little. If you're just on one, you might fall off. I like the awkward dismount there. Um, that's happened to me. So book binding is necessary, but perhaps not sufficient. That's kind of the conclusion I draw here. Um, and we always need to be moving beyond whatever formal um, education you, um, you may have. Um, you might need to look at multiple sources, and that these are changing professions. So is this what library conservators really should be doing all day? Covering books in full leather? Um, I don't think so. And I love this Helen Shenton quote. She's a head of preservation at the British Library. 
Wanted, book conservator with doctorate in polymer chemistry, conversing with inter and intranet. That's a little old, isn't it? With knowledge of historic bibliography, pre-Christian, two contemporary book arts, Diamond Sutra to the Great Blue Koran. And by the way, excellent bench skills. Um, read kind of craft skills there, really. Bench skills, it's a, it's a vocabulary thing. But I wanted to show you a real um, job description for a rare books um, conservator at, at Harvard here. And, you know, I've I put in blue the part that talks about treatment, uh, where you would be working at the bench with your hands. Um, treat a broad range of books and manuscripts. OK. Now here it goes on. Many things, not highlighted in blue. And then, ah, performs conservation treatments of varying complexity. But these other issues, you can be sure, are going to take a lot of time and are essential to the care of the collections. Surveys, extremely important. Um, exhibition, oh, that'll, that'll eat your lunch right there. Um, emergency, you've got to handle emergencies. If you're not there for emergencies, you, you just can't do that. Um, you know, workflow considerations, and then you supervise interns, you supervise students, you supervise technicians, and so on. Now here's the qualifications, a graduate degree in conservation. Um, not necessarily a library degree here, so, so that's, that's interesting. And then a couple years experience. Strong knowledge of the history of the book structure, history of book binding printing, writing, paper making, and so on. And it goes on. Environmental monitoring, commercial library binding, oh, um, and word processing and stuff. So maybe I should just say, to heck with passion, here's what you need. You need to study for your GREs, get excellent grades, take organic chemistry, get a recommendation from a conservation professional, and get a pre-program experience, and you are off and running. But um, you know those formal requirements are not sufficient either. Um, just like the crafts of it are not you know, sufficient in and of themselves to do the work. But I do think the degrees are a kind of currency. Um, you're entering an academic realm. Most academic librarians have two masters. Um, it's very typical in larger institutions. And if you go to Iceland, well, not a good one. Don't use the money in Iceland. Apparently it's no good. But when you go to another country, um, you, know, you use their currency. And you can't force them to change their currency. They're bigger than you. Um, but remember that great things can happen when you put your mind to it, regardless of degree. I don't, I'm not idealistic enough to think that a person without a, um, you know, a, a college degree today could do what Paul Banks did, but I'm not entirely sure it's not possible. And uh, so craft isn't enough, what is? And I really think that it's teamwork. Um, I rely on my colleagues in paper conservation. I rely on the librarians, the archivists, the folks who are um, doing digital preservation, photo preservation, all, all of the above. Because um, library collections are very, they don't just have books, they have lots of things in them. And uh, I'm just part of that team. Um, all these things, we have to deal with disasters, exhibits, uh, management, mentoring, research, and big things, digital projects, folks. I mean, when your rare book librarian comes to you and says, hi, I made an arrangement with Google, we're now going to be Scanning thousands of books, um, and um, can you help me with that? Well, yeah, <laughs> you better be prepared to help with that. Um, but no graduate program can cover all that needs to be covered. <coughs> it's just, it, it can't happen. You sort of skim the surface of all those topics that we talked about. And I think that, that the field itself um, needs to support people, help get make sure those volunteer opportunities, try to take interns when at all possible for folks who have finished their coursework and need an internship. Um, and, you know, to, to honor that bench work remains unique, it, it gives us access to culture that people depend on conservators to be able to articulate and think about. So we do need to keep that in mind. Um, I think internships and postgraduate opportunities are really important. Um, and we don't have enough postgraduate opportunities for people in, in book conservation. Um, and furthermore, I really think that project cons conservation positions where you have one or two years, sort of like a journeyman phase and an apprentice where you can go in and really get a lot of bench work done poten um, potentially, um, I think that's great. That's what worked for me. After I did the Library of Congress, I was able to work on two different projects at the Huntington. It was a, a really important thing for me. And assistant conservator positions, they're not there. That's a kind of a structural problem. You get out and you may not be ready to be head of the lab, but the actual job title, assistant conservator, doesn't exist too many places. 
and I wish that it did, because that's truly entry level when you enter as an assistant conservator. Um, but I think graduate programs need to live examined lives. Um, and one day my class decided to show up in roller skates dressed as a roller derby team. Um, you just never know. <laughs> the shaping of library um, and conservation education is not a mystery. Um, it's going to be shaped by those who show up. It's going to be shaped by those who teach. It's going to be shaped by the students. It doesn't just come down from above fully formed. Um, we have a lot of different avenues in book training in America. I think when I started out, there weren't as many as there are now. North Bennett's adding a lot of conservation emphasis. You can get a conservation diploma now from American Academy of Bookminding. There's MFAs in the book arts. There's art conservation programs. Buffalo's especially um, educating folks in the book arts um, or book conservation. There's a Texas program, but there's not a, a you know an education monoculture but there may be a hiring one culture. And I just, you know, how to solve that. It's not up to the graduate programs. Um, gosh, that book got big. <laughs> um, so, you know, you got a young field meeting an institutional degree culture. It's, it's an uneasy combination. And finally, if you're thinking about rare skills, I even conclude here. If you're thinking about rare skills for rare books, I think the rarest thing is finding what you want to do in life. It's very rare. And then the opportunity to pursue that work does not always come along. And the confidence to see that many paths can lead you where you might want to be doesn't always happen. And really, there's just lucky combinations of historical moments, like happened with Paul Banks, where you know, his skill set wouldn't work today, but it took him a long ways um, where, when he was. Now, I know I've been talking about craft and bookbinding and book conservation skills. Um, you want to know what really keeps me up at night? The death of reading. <laughs> I'll just sort of to, uh, you know, they always say when you conclude, you should open it up to a broader concern. I do have a broader concern, and that is that people don't read anymore. Um, that we're becoming a screen-based culture, and that's going to change a lot of things. But I have been assured by many people that screen-based culture is making people love books more. So I'm going to hang on to that and say the book is dead. Long live the book conservator. Um, and I'll just end here, you know, um, here, James Billington uh, has this very inspiring quote to the preserver, restorer, or conservator. A uh, conserver is the indispensable primary living link in the human chain that connects yesterday's accomplishments with tomorrow's possibilities. Um, it's a very lofty idea. So thanks to all of you for your Friday afternoon um, stint here. And thanks to the Brodskys for making this possible. It's very, very important. Um, that we have these opportunities. And I'm following in the footsteps of some amazing people who have presented here. And I just want to say that I'm very honored to have um, to be part of that group of folks who have presented here. Um, this university's done a great thing. And um, the students I've worked with, um, they're amazing. So thank you very much.
but so what, what does this mean for the, the profession? It means it, it's very very important and it's really affecting where I work a lot. We have added classes in, I mean, we, we cover plastics in a very general way. Um, we're gonna have to get a lot more into it. I mean, all the programs are probably gonna have to get a lot more into it. I think the art conservation programs cover plastic already and much more thoroughly than we do. But we're really starting to move into non-paper stuff in a big way. Um, and we're actually looking to offer a certification in um, non-print media for libraries. And that job is starting to come up. You're starting to see um, institutions with non-print. Um, they usually call them preservation specialists. They're not conservators. But um, that's not always the case. And I'm mean, talking about special collections. So um, you'll be interested to know that Science News actually has this very issue on the front cover came to me just maybe yesterday. Um, there's a European group that's called Polyplastics, I think, or Pop, Pop Plastic or something that's studying all the different um, plastics. So what you're going to have to, you know, conservators will have to know their limits and say, I don't know, and we need to find people who do in certain levels. It may be more of a housing issue. Um, there's a lot of things that just aren't well known at this point about the aging properties. So. Um, it is affecting, I think, all the conservation programs, and ours included. I mean, we had a situation at the Harry Ransom Center, a student gave a paper on, where they thought, oh, we'll put this interesting art book in a box. Well, it happened to be a book that was exhibiting a few <coughs> overlay pages, gel-colored sort of pages that hadn't really been noticed. They were acetate, uh, acetate, yeah. And when they put it in the drop spine cloth covered box, they had made it, started woo, going into, not solution, but it softened up and cockled and moved a, a great deal. Because of the glue that had been used to make the box was off gas and creating an environment that changed the structure of the plastics permanently. Um, so the box was not a good thing for that. And so this is where we really need to be very careful because modern materials. So it's, it is, it's there, it's gonna be happening. I mean, I would say if you suddenly acquired a bunch of textiles, you might be in the same situation that you have a, you know, traditional library conservators are no more prepared to deal with a whole group of costumes than they might be to deal with, um, you know, a whole group of Bakelite bangles. Um, so you'd always have to be looking for some outside help. But other questions? And further questions for you if you want. So. Yes. Yeah, the Von Ranke collection here, I've never had my hands on it, but uh, they used to, I guess they built the Tali uh, Humanities Building actually to house it after they bought it in like 1883 or so, and, and, and had it stored a long time. And when I was just, the, my connection with it, because I haven't touched it, I was at a Chamber of Commerce meeting about five months ago, when there's a guy who was about 38, I forget his name, I think it's Pete or something, it, He's locally here. He, he's a business uh, consultant for people who want to open businesses in Ger with connections in Germany or make mm -hmm. partnerships with people in, in the U.S. and Germany because he's lived there like half of his 38 years in mm -hmm. Germany and half here. And I mentioned to him that if there's any Germans who come to Syracuse, <coughs> that there might be considerable interest in, in seeing what the Von Ranke collection is. Because to, to me, I mean, I've heard it since '72. I've been here mm -hmm. uh, going to '70 at school. I never <coughs> touched any of it myself. I think, and, and yet I'm a real bookie type person. And so I'm saying this distance isn't necessarily good for collections because, wow. you know, to, are they about use? Yeah, and I, you know, actually the um, the there was a special edition of education in the New York Times, Sunday New York Times, that had a big article called, Touch This Book. <laughs> and it was all about these history of the book classes that people were doing all around the United States where they're letting undergraduates touch books, old books. Um, and, you know, it was, it was done in a very, um, you know, admiring fashion. But I, I mean, I can't answer the question in an institutional setting here, but certainly it's a push and pull about where is the light of the material and does it happen, what, what interaction point does it happen, and you know, what do we sacrifice for usability or not? So. I, I think the rocket collection is actually a great example of good conservation work. I might say that Peter was <coughs> our conservator was intimately involved in. Is that right, Peter? It is. Um, I would also 
say that there is has been a connection to, to Germany. We had the, the German Consul General came to campus last year to lecture to the Maxwell School, and he happened to have a PhD in history, and more than anything else, he wanted to see some of the Ronca materials, so we were able to do that. Um, more problematic is that there are parts of the manuscript collection where page one is here, and then page two is in the the National Library in Berlin. Oh. So, um, so, so there are challenges, but certainly in terms of the, the topic of this discussion, I think it's a, a well-conserved uh, uh, mm -hmm. collection. I was showing it off just this afternoon. Yeah. yeah, well, special, I mean, special collections are, are changing. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And I think this screen-based access, what I'm watching people deal with, at least at the Harry Ransom Center with special collections, is now how far to go with that and when do you, you know, substitute screen-based for the original and so on and so on. Yeah. And one of the things to remember about the Ronca collection was the first circulating collection at this university. Oh my gosh, it must be there. So those books, when they came here, you know, when they got moved into special collections, it actually helped to preserve them because they were no longer as heavily used. And the conservation needs of that collection are incredible and, you know, are ongoing. Yeah. Well, they've got a collection at, at the Harry Ransom Center now where it's um, it's um, ink, carbon, or iron gall and parchment, and it, 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 it seems like it, they're losing a lot of, of, um, of the you know, pigment coming off of the ink. And um, it's flaking. It's either powdery or coming off in big chunks in places. These are heavily used collections for various history classes and art history classes on campus and they're really trying to figure out how do we allow access to these anymore when we feel like we're losing and not think that this is getting to be crazy and you know some of the curators were like this was a study collection it should be used let them use it up we didn't we're not this isn't our collection area these are being used for educational purposes and we don't that's their life that's what we bought them for so they could just they should be used and we should be able to turn the pages and etc and you have other curators saying, absolutely not. We don't have very many you know, examples of this in our collection, and we're going to not lose any more ink for this class. These are difficult battles. <laughs> so. Any other? Yes? Has the Harry Ransom Center entered into a mass digitization partnership at all? <sighs> not to my knowledge, but you know, the Google wives never tell. <laughs> 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 no, but the, actually, University of Texas has the Benson Latin American Collection is digitizing its circulating collection, which is a major undertaking, and that is a special collection by any standard. Um, so, does that? Well, I'm wondering what. So, what demands are placed on you as a conservator? Well, those I am actually not a bench conservator anymore. I'm a full-time teacher, so there's no demands placed on me. But there's demands placed on me to pre prepare my students for this. Um, so, so what demands are placed on me? Well, be part of the process. Be part of the conversation. Don't be blindsided by it. Um, and take advantage of it. A lot of these projects comes with a, come with a lot of money. And if you're there for it, you might get the money. It, it was interesting to me. We had a student who ended up in Charlottesville, Virginia. Her uh, husband was going to graduate school there. And there wasn't any, seemingly, no conservation work for her there. But she should knock on their doors, and she's like, well, y'all don't have a conservator. And they're like, yeah, right, we don't. We don't need one. Okay. You don't have a preservation administrator? No, no, no. But then, within a few months, they had signed a Google contract, and Google had a line on their contract saying, this is where the preservation officer signs off. And they're like, oh, we don't have a preservation officer. <laughs> so they called Holly, you know, and suddenly she's um, inserted into that flow. I mean, she's in charge of... of, of of understanding how they're going to treat the books. They take her into the secret chambers where all the digitization happens, and she helps decide, you know, whether this can work, whether it won't work. Um, you know, how are we going to judge what books can go off with them? I and it's usually done somewhere off site. I mean, it's not done on, on campus. They ship them all off. Um, so, you know, she's part of the kind of decision making of what can go, what can't go. Um, you know, which can get us into a whole copyright sort of issue, which I'm not going into. But, I mean, basically, special collections are often not cataloged. There's a problem that there's not control. You wouldn't know, necessarily, with some special collections. You sent off 500 books, count them coming back, but, I mean, they're not necessarily cataloged. It's what's called the hidden collections. It's very laborious to catalog um, special collections. So, 
you know, you have to deal with you know, inventory, security, um, safety, protocol. Are you going to treat things before they get digitized, after they get digitized? Um, you know, and then are you going to not give anyone the original anymore and only offer them the digitized copy? Those are, those are the meetings you have to go to. I guess what you're asking is, I, I think my answer is you've got to go to a lot of meetings with these people, mm -hmm. um, which, you know, it's not very romantic, but very important. Um, I'm curious about, um, I guess, environmental issues. If you're a, a conservator, say, in Chile, oh, yeah. are you going to have different concerns than a conservator in Iceland? Absolutely. Or do the books usually end up in a controlled environment so it doesn't really matter so much? Oh, no, How does really. that? I mean, I, don't, I can't speak for, for Iceland, for Iceland, but um, I, I have been to Chile and various other Latin American countries, and, and often what you see there, and, you know, this, you guys have more of this, I think, in the east than, than in, in Texas or the west coast, is the um, kind of collections in situ. They're in historic buildings. They're in buildings that would be very expensive to retrofit with the proper environmental controls, you know, air conditioning, blah, 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 blah. Um, and they're not about to move those collections out of these important buildings, important cultural collections in important cultural buildings. Um, and, and so they make do with, with what they have. It's not that there's not an understanding. It's just the, sometimes there's not money, but it's just a situation of well, this is where the books belong. Um, this is where they're going to be used. And so, but yeah, definitely. I mean, you're in a human environment, you have a different, I mean, I'm in Texas. People, someone said, oh, that must be a great place for books, but, but not really. <laughs> we have a lot of bugs and uh, slimy things and broken air conditioning. Yeah, serious humidity, um, which leads to all kinds of troubles. I'm not, I'm trying to think, like, where's the perfect climate? The problem is the books aren't outside. Like, I was in um, Peru and Arequipa, very high, very dry, perfect environment for books, all the librarians and archivists kept saying. But I found a whole bunch of moldy books. It was a perfect environment outside for the books. But if you have a leak in your roof, you have a micro environment, and that is not a perfect environment for the books. So, um, you know, yeah, it's a constant struggle dealing with this. And, you know, maybe we'll just put, you know, we'll make a perfect book environment run by, you know, robots and um, it will be far away and we'll just be looking at things. Um, and, well, you know, that's where a lot of, like, I mean, like, University of Chicago is building, you know, I think a kind of a major sort of repository and then things are, are sort of brought up. And actually every university is building repositories and putting a lot of their books on off-site storage and then having to take them out of that perfect condition and condition them before they hand them to you. They have to be sort of you know, conditioned for a not-so-perfect environment, and then you get them. And then they put them through some sort of holding chambers until they can get back into that cold, dark place where they belong. So, all right. And then, you know, and the filing, I mean, it's not open stacks, right? I mean, everything's done by, it's like massive. We've got cherry pickers and huge, huge shelving systems. They're kind of cool places. Yes? When you talked about disbanding this yeah, massive yeah. book, yeah, yeah. and you weren't happy with no. just making a new spine. With what? Making a new spine. Right. Well, I was worried that I would never be able to get that pages back together so that they were the same dimensions they used to be, so I could put the original spine back on it and have no difference from this, the, the, the dimension that the book used to have. Yeah. and. When you took all these original parts off, you removed the leather sewing supports. How did oh, you yeah. decide what the best thing to do would be? I mean, you had the demands of the people who own the book and you know your own skills and background. Well, it's it's so complicated. I mean, the decision making look? part is, you know, it's not perfect. Um, I don't think I would have made the decision if um, I hadn't had two interns. Because it was a very laborious process. I mean, those were po the, the, the folks who were helping me, the photo conservators. Um, but they had a problem-solving mindset that applied perfectly well to book conservation. It just wasn't the objects they were most familiar with. Um, so they were quick studies. Um, and, um, but I would have made, you know, I would have probably made that decision differently in a different circumstances. I can envision saying to the curator, you didn't get on my schedule. I'm all booked up with this exhibit. I can't deal with this till next summer. And when I do deal with it, this will take 40 hours, mat, you know, at least. And that means I won't be able to work on 10 other things that you need worked on. It's up to the curator then. 
do you want me to do that or can we just sort of hook this thing together mildly or use it in a special cradle and get you know, put the spine in a different box? You know, other things we could have done. Does that answer your question? So one by one, huh? One by one to make the decisions of how to there's the book. not um, it's really, I, I don't know how I would uh, make a flow chart for the decision making process. I'm sure I, if I sat down long enough, I might. But I've seen some of those flow charts and they're just mind boggling. Um, it's very, I mean, it takes more time to do the flow chart than it does to like do the treatment. Um, I'm sure. And, and then not everyone would agree with your flow chart. But I think you're, you really have to look at the institutional concerns. At that point, I was working for the Huntington Library and they had concerns and I was there to meet them. And it was happenstance that I happened to have interns who could help me with a quite complicated treatment. I will say that I, I wanted them to learn from it. I saw this, aha, this will be a great treatment for them to do. They'll learn a lot, it'll be fun. Those things do enter into my mind. Yeah. So. Yes? What was the duration of time from the beginning of that project? <sighs> You know, I have to say that it, it didn't take as long as it might have because there was three of us going at it. So it seems to me that I wrote down something like 40 hours, but a lot of, I was not keeping careful track because at that point my job was not to be the, Huntington, uh, the Huntington's conservator. My role was um, to work with um, the students, the, the interns more. So when I say 40 hours, um, I couldn't tell you exactly how accurate that was. There's drying time and stuff. You're never just working on one thing. You're working on a ton of things all at once, you know, so. But that's kind of a rough estimate. You know, sewing is the longest process there. That took a while, three days, you know, two of these. Yes. Yeah. Somebody? Yes. In uh, Austin, I, my, own sense is that Austin spent some money through the years on their libraries and, and on books, you know, oil money or whatever money. <laughs> the legend of Harry Ransom lives on, yes. And, and, and uh, <laughs> how does that play out? And, and maybe to, to conjoin that, you know, what, what you want, you want to talk to there, with the sense of how does the book uh, conservation uh, activity play to the future? In terms of what what type of audience expansion would be uh, uh, reasonable? Audience expansion? You mean more students, or you mean? I mean that people that are being served by it now. With the just it's more than just institutions like holding books. It's, it's also for researchers and and even for those who want to resell them. I suppose that just want to improve their value to a certain extent. Yeah, well, you can, you, if you've ever watched Antiques Roadshow, you know that you can totally destroy the value of uh, historic artifacts by giving them to a conservator. Yeah. So uh, you've got to watch the valuation issue. But um, I, I guess your answer has more to do with uh, the future of special collections. And I think conservation is inextricably linked to the future of library collections, both circulating and special. Um, library conservation, I consider myself um, foremost really a library conservator. My, my, um, my reality is linked to the changes in those um, institutions. And um, I can't foresee the, the future in that. I, you know, I, I think that people hint at, oh, there'll be renewed life and lots more money for special collections because of these digital projects. I don't know. I mean, I certainly see it's keeping people busy, some people, so. But I don't know if that answers your question. Um, for book conservation, um, I guess we don't see each ourselves in some ways. I think we'd like more awareness of our services. I think we'd like more awareness of, um, of conservation as a service. Um, we're kind of a basement reality, and people don't know about us in very public in a lot of ways. From, from an edu educational research um, resource, if the books are an educational uh, research resource, uh, is, is there some, I'll throw out the following, say say the average uh, cost of, of uh, having a book conservator around is $20 an hour. And, uh, 100. Uh, well, okay, well then. <laughs> I mean, that's what people charge in private conservation. 
book. So, but when when a researcher comes in to use this book, let's say, say it's me, and I come in and I'm going to sit upstairs on the sixth floor and say, gee, can I see something in English that's from the Von Ranke collection mm -hmm. that's available and having to do with uh, multinational uh, historical analysis from uh, 1840. Uh -huh. Uh, and should I expect, to, in a sense, to say to myself, well, if I'm here, I should be willing to pay, you know, or be able to oh. donate something. Towards the know. conservation. Yeah, you know, a lot of libraries have got this adopt-a-book program. Um, but, you know, remember, the, most, of, most libraries and archives are kind of in a non-profit world, and so we're not used to asking people for money when they use a book. Um, I'm certainly not interested in asking people for money to use a book. Um, our job is, is to make it available, but also as librarians we need to make it available, as conservators we need to save it for the future. And sometimes those can be um, kind of difficult solutions to work out in terms of what you give to somebody to use. But I think that, that um, fundraising for more conservation work gets taken on different ways in different institutions. A lot of different solutions to that, so, yeah. Actually, I would add also that, that one of these sort of important um, factors in determining what goes through a conservation lab, at least here, historically, has been what people want to right. see in our reading room. So, and you're providing a service to us in some ways. I mean, we have 50,000 boxes of material, a couple hundred thousand volumes. We can't possibly mm -hmm. expect 40 hours to be spent on each of those items. Um, so knowing what people want to see helps us to set those priorities. Now, use is very much a criteria. I mean, there's sort of chemical problems that are not use-driven and how they need to be dealt with. And I, you know, I think iron gall ink is an important one there where um, used or not, the stuff's in real trouble. And we need help understanding how to work with it in the future. And um, that may not be, the conservation of that may not be use-driven, or that may turn out to be the only criteria we can ever logically execute, is if someone asks for it, fix it. Otherwise, let it die. Or it's going to be a hard one. Um, there, it's like brittle paper was another one where we really wanted mass solutions. And it wasn't use-based. It was the whole substrate of materials dying fast. And what do we do? Um, so there are certain sort of emergencies that, are, that make conservation not use-driven. But in general, I think, as you say, you, you're the users. The users are the point um, of it all. Readers, yes. Or at least lookers. <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, I'm happy to answer any other questions. And I guess I'll be seeing some of you at the workshop tomorrow. And I look forward to it. Unless there's more questions. <laughs> well, in terms of just, just what's on, I mean, yesterday was the first time I saw what's called a, a Dell uh, text, no, what's it called? Netbook. A netbook at the three to four hundred dollar uh, replacement for a laptop, I guess. Oh. And and but beyond that, the Kindle system. Oh, I don't yeah. Across the Kindle system, but that's yeah. being pushed pretty hard, isn't it? I mean. Yeah, evil yeah, digital books. You guys use them? You in here own a Kindle? Digital books? Hundreds and hundreds of titles at your fingertips. The problem is nobody reads, but hey, whatever. Um, the uh, yeah, no, those will be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> to conserve. <laughs> I don't know how that's going to work. <laughs> Especially since you can annotate them, supposedly. I don't know if those annotations stay with the book permanently. You don't own those books. You own the device. Um, I think that's how that works. And I don't even get into copyright and ownership issues, which is huge in libraries right now. The throwing away hard copy that they own, buying subscriptions to journals that they don't own, and if the business company goes out of business, eh, no more journals. Eh, big deal. So there's an interesting one that I'm library talk. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs>